The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Sami Shah. This is Ear to Asia. When you have such repeated blunt trauma to a newly formed state whose own identity and reason for existence is still up for debate, even within the country, then the power will rapidly and dramatically converge towards the people that are able to get things done. And those are the people with the guns, and that is the Pakistani military. They have been successfully able to create an enemy and then sustain that enemy for decades because that is when you can interfere into a democratic political system by saying we are the only ones that can protect you from this enemy. So the the creation of the enemy has been very important for the survival and the growth of Pakistani military. In this episode, the outsized influence of the military in Pakistan's politics. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialists at the University of Melbourne. For the nearly eight decades since its founding, Pakistan has grappled with finding the right balance between civilian democratic governance and the power wielded by its armed forces. The military has directly ruled the country for almost half of its existence through coup d'etat and martial law. But even during periods of civilian rule, its influence has loomed large, often described as a state within a state. The result has been a democracy where no prime minister has ever completed a five-year term. These days, the mechanisms allowing the military's reach into affairs of state vary from advisory roles and hand-picked appointments to media censorship and manipulating judicial cases. The economic clout of the military's vast business empire is also seen by some as a source of leverage. So, what were the historical circumstances and power dynamics that elevated the military to such a dominant position? What does such an imbalance between civilian institutions and the military mean for Pakistan's democratic development and ability to create and enforce effective public policy today? And how do Pakistan's ordinary citizens feel about having their fate so deeply intertwined with that of the men in uniform? Joining me to discuss the Pakistani military's enduring ability to call the shots are Musharraf Zaidi, a seasoned policy and political analyst who's also founder and CEO of Tabad Lab, an Islamabad-based think tank and policy advisory firm. And by former journalist and now academic Dr. Aisha Jahangir, currently a postdoctoral research fellow at the Centre for Media Transition at the University of Technology, Sydney. Welcome to Air to Asia, Musharraf and Aisha. Thank you, Sami, for having me on the show. I'm delighted to be on the show. Thanks for having us. Later, we'll get to the military's political hand in and around Pakistan's recent federal elections. But I want to start by rewinding to the historical roots of the Pakistani military's rise to power. Pakistan gained independence from British rule in 1947. Yet, it's not as though every nation state that emerged out of mid-20th century decolonization was destined to be de facto ruled in perpetuity by its military. What is it about Pakistan historically that set the stage for almost 80 years of the military ultimately calling the shots. Musharraf, I'd like to start with you there. It's a great question. It's one that I think most Pakistanis grapple with constantly, Sami. The enduring kind of schism or the enduring principal contradiction in Pakistan has been who should be calling the shots. Should it be elected leaders? Should it be bureaucrats, whether military or civilian? Um, should it be a military dictator? And although this seems to pop up every few years, it's really a constant question. So the way that I've tried to understand this over the years is to think about the genesis and kind of synthesis of the idea of Pakistan, and in particular, the kind of days, weeks, and months in the run-up to and after August 14th, 1947. That's the day that the British left this part of the world and two new nations at that time, three after 1971, but two new nations emerged. One was India and one was Pakistan. So to try and understand what caused 
the dominance of the military. I think we have to look at the manner in which the assets of what used to be the Raj uh, or the British sort of colonial project in this part of the world, those assets, the ones that were local, the way they were divvied up between what came to be Pakistan and what came to be India. So this distinction between India and Pakistan, this is something that is built in to the DNA of both countries in the way that the civil services and the military and the monies that were left behind were divided between India and Pakistan. I can go into a lot of detail on the numbers, but the bottom sort of line is that Pakistan was promised, uh, let's say, $100 of a vastly larger sum. Out of $1,000, Pakistan was promised $100. It only got $33. So it never got its fair share. And its fair share was not quite fair to begin with. So that's the monetary division. In terms of civil servants, there was roughly 1,200 civil servants within the Indian civil service at that time that were Muslim. And of the Muslim civil servants, only about 100 opted for Pakistan. So the vast majority of Indian Muslim civil servants, i.e. the Indian Muslim elites, actually chose to stay on. They were more excited by what Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru and Mohandas K. Gandhi were offering. And so that's a division in terms of the civil service. And similarly with the military, there was a more fair division in terms of the number of troops, but in terms of where all the ammunition was made, where all the weapons were made, where all the depots were, where all the training centers were, all of that infrastructure of a robust military, of a robust state, of a robust civil service, of the treasury, all of that ended up with India and Pakistan didn't have any of those things. Now, what further complicated this is that on the day of independence, India just decided to annex and take over a part of the world that is known as Kashmir. And that has been the sort of uh, bleeding wound of South Asia now for over 75 years. It is the source of almost all conflict between India and Pakistan. There's been other things that have complicated the relationship. But from day one, Pakistan had to adopt a defensive posture with a military and a treasury and a civil service that was much less, much less capable, much less in size, much less in magnitude, and didn't have the world's approval in the way that this newly emergent India did. And so the power dynamic in Pakistan ended up skewing dramatically towards the military, because when it came time to define what Pakistan was, without really having a chance to have a debate in parliament or to write books about it or think about it, Pakistan was at war from day one, and it was a defensive war. And it's never really been able to emerge out of that. Now, of course, in 1971, Pakistan, which was twice the size, because remember, Bangladesh and Pakistan used to be one country, in 1971, in a very bloody divorce between these two countries, and a, and a brutal one, these two countries also split. And so there was the trauma of 1947, the trauma of 1971, and since September 11th, really since 1979, the trauma of being the neighbor of Afghanistan, a country that within 40 years was invaded by two global superpowers, the Soviet Union in 1979 and the United States, NATO, ISAF, including Australia in 2001. When you have such repeated blunt trauma to a newly formed state whose own identity and reason for existence is still up for debate, even within the country, then the power will rapidly and dramatically converge towards the people that are able to get things done. And those are the people with the guns, and that is the Pakistani military. Is there a degree of sinister sort of planning behind this? I, I don't think so. Is it entirely the fault of India or the United Kingdom in terms of its departure from South Asia or Afghanistan and the Taliban or the Soviet Union? No, it's not entirely the fault of external factors, but I think it would be really brutally unfair to ignore all those factors and to locate the source of all that is wrong with Pakistani democracy as the Pakistani military itself. The military is the way that it is, and Pakistan is military dominated the way that it is because of the circumstances in the birthing and the adolescence and now the quasi-adulting of this uh, beautiful young, but still lighter weight than India country that's struggling to survive. 
Aisha, given that we've now got years of growth and everything, have we seen the military's involvement in Pakistani politics evolve over that time? Have there been changes in the way the military's decided to, or been forced to arguably, step into the country's life cycle? Um, thank you, Sami, for inviting me to the podcast. I just want to start by acknowledging the indigenous First Nation people of the land. I'm, I'm talking to you from the land of the Gadigal people. I will go with uh, Musharraf's point about British colonial legacy. It's very fundamental to understand where the roots of this organization comes from. So British generals continued to head the Pakistani military until 1951. And later, the authority was transferred to another general, um, Ayub Khan. Just seven years later, Ayub Khan became Pakistan's second president through a military coup. So Pakistan has had a lot of history of military coups. This foundation also led to the establishment of the most notorious spy agency of the world, the Inter-Services Intelligence. But what happened was that they kept getting more and more opportunities because of their geopolitical positioning at one of the most important parts of the world. And as Musharraf also mentioned, Russia and Afghanistan and the stakes that the U.S. has had. I think what has really created and given the military a strong foundation, and as we can see that they are evolving over time and continue to indirectly or directly take charge of the country's politics, is that they have been successfully able to create an enemy and then sustain that enemy for decades because that is when you can interfere into a democratic political system by saying we are the only ones that can protect you from this enemy. So that the creation of the enemy has been very important for the survival and the growth of uh, Pakistani military. And of course, then the sheer size and then the money that was pouring in and specifically in the 1980s, when the Pakistani military also became part or alliance of the US, uh, you know, covert war in Afghanistan, in which Pakistan was, as we all know, um, and no hidden in fact, used as a proxy against the declining Soviet Union. And then we saw the execution of the elected prime minister, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. So this is because at every stage we see that the military becoming more and more powerful and have more and more control, indirect or direct, of the political system. And then we all know we are all, when I say we, I mean our generation that was born in the 80s specifically, is still reaping the effects of General Ziaul Haq's religious extremism, which shaped the history of the country and where it is going, and also the appropriation of religion for that matter. And so the rule that General Ziaul Haq had over the country and his Islamization and this obsession with strategic depth for interference in Afghanistan also kept all the money coming in and the military continued to being a very important actor in international politics. And of course, we then later saw the assassination of the elected Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto under the rule of another general, General Parvez Musharraf. And then, of course, Al-Qaeda, you know, leader Osama bin Laden being found there. And the fact that while they were receiving funds from the U.S., as the frontline ally in the war against terrorism. And of course, who can forget the Cold War? There was so much financial backing from the US during the Cold War, and this bolstered its might domestically while allowing it to undertake adventures abroad as well, in which it was unaccountable. Somehow, the state of being unaccountable has also allowed them this massive growth over time. And of course, I can go on and on forever in Pakistani military's involvement in the Arab conflicts and then, of course, Bangladesh rape camps and all the money that has been coming from Saudi Arabia. I think the strategic alliances of the Pakistani military have really also helped them with the US, with China, with Saudi Arabia. It has helped them not only take control of the defense of the country, but also politics and also economy. Well, there's the nitty gritty of the practicalities of the military's role in the country. But then there's also the narratives that a organization like a military needs to create and cultivate for people to buy into its existence and its role. So, you know, if, if I was to ask both of you this, um, what do you think is the narrative that the Pakistan military has created over time that ma has made the public for a, an extended period of time, at least, buy into the military's importance? importance to Pakistan. Is it an external, there's enemies abroad and we need to protect you? Or was it more to do with religion or poor civilian governance? Which narrative worked for the military the most? Musharraf? 
Well, I think so. I mean, it's a it's a really big country, and it's a really really big military, and so it isn't just one narrative that you know the country has adopted about itself. And by extension, it isn't just one narrative within the country that various actors in the political power sphere deploy to you know one up on each other. Now let's take Pakistan today. So Pakistan has four neighboring countries, the Iranian regime, I suppose, Iran, Afghanistan, run by the Taliban, China, run by President Xi and the Communist Party in China, and India, run by the right-wing Hindu supremacist leadership of Narendra Modi. Now, when we analyze countries, or frankly, any entities, we don't do it in the absence of context. So the context in 2024 is that a hybrid democracy, uh, a flawed, deeply flawed, maybe even failing democracy, is being judged for, for example, in your intro, you said that no Pakistani prime minister had ever completed their five-year term. This is absolutely true. What is also true is that this is the fourth elected parliament that has completed its term. The first one being 2008, the second one 2013, the third 2018, and this is now the fourth in 2024. So if we accept the criticism that no prime minister has ever completed the term, we must also accept something at least broadly positive about the trajectory of the country since 2008. Now, if you ask my honest opinion, I honestly wonder whether this kind of compromised democracy is necessarily better than a full-on military takeover. That's a debate that I have with myself, uh, I have with other friends, and that Pakistanis, if not publicly, certainly privately, ask ourselves this question. But against what metric is this flawed democracy being measured? Is it being measured against the human rights and minority consuming regime in India? Is it being measured against the Ayatollahs in Iran who are at war with the entire region, including the US and other Western powers? Is it with the Afghan Taliban that have basically made killing fields of Afghanistan since they came together in the early 1990s? Or are we being measured against a repressive and non-democratic China? So in any of these cases, this is our immediate neighborhood. If you go further out, you go to the Arabian Gulf, you have a series of monarchies that perhaps Pakistan could be compared with. If you go further beyond that, you have Egypt, another military dictatorship that Pakistan could be compared with. If you go north, you have the Central Asian republics, none of which are robust democracies, most of which are long-term autocratic dictatorial regimes. But there's one thing that none of these other countries have to deal with, and that is None of these countries are brown Ukraine, and none of them have to deal with brown Russia next door to them. But Pakistan is brown Ukraine, and it does have to deal with brown Russia. And brown Russia, of course, is India. So I think, is the military justified in the way that it's treated opponents of its clear dominance over politics, including recently and including today? Uh, no, it's not in any way defensible the way that some PTI supporters have been treated by the state, just like it wasn't defensible for the military to support the PTI treating supporters of the PML in this way six years ago. And we go further back, the judicial assassination of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto being just one of many violations of basic rule of law as far as the military's dominance is concerned. But just because the military is wrong in how it positions itself locally, the military is wrong to demonize politicians, to use corruption as a bludgeon against all civilian, uh, both technocrats as well as elected leaders, as well as bureaucrats, as well as judges. All of these things are very wrong and they shouldn't happen. And there has to be some sort of an arrival at a point where things can get better. And I honestly don't know after 25 years of doing this, whether I have a formula for that. But what I also concurrently know is that it would be brutal to misrepresent history, to take things out of context and present Pakistan as some unique case. Just to take two quick examples, and I'll, and I'll wrap up real quick. The professor mentioned that, you know, the Pakistani military was run by British generals until 1951. The Indian military was run by British generals until 1949. The professor rightly mentioned that Pakistan has been a recipient off and on 
of uh, Western, and uh, she neglected to, although I'm sure she would get to it. It's also been a huge recipient of Chinese assistance over the last decade and a half. But when we look at the list of the top 10 recipients of aid since 1946, both economic and military, Pakistan comes in sub-India below number 15. So the representation that somehow Pakistan is this sort of the scourge that feasts on aid and creates problems in the neighborhood. Take a good look at the neighborhood we're talking about. Take a good look at where Western and non-Western aid and assistance has been going to. Take a good look at those interests and take a good look at the comparators for this country. And what we discover is that, yes, the military is widely off the mark in terms of how it conducts itself domestically, but the rest of the world is widely off the mark in terms of creating a false narrative about this country. And I think Western academia in particular has a lot to answer for on that front. Aisha, just to kind of take what Musharraf just said, it makes me think of an analogy, if we may go down that road, of, you know, when I'd go home with a bad report card and I'd show it to my parents, my mother would say, why'd you get a C? And my argument would be, well, all the other kids got Cs and Ds as well. And then my mother would say, well, you should have gotten an A. That's all I care about. Should we be holding the Pakistan military to a standard that is contextual or should we be holding it to a standard that is more objective and regardless of the regional conflicts, etc., they've, you know, created a narrative and had an influence that's outsized on the civilian government? Is that something that, you know, you would agree with either way? Um, I understand that Pakistan may not be on the top 10 list of aid receivers or money from the US, for that matter. But what needs to be seen is whatever money has been received, either it was from China or, well, not from China in this context, mostly from the US and Saudi Arabia. How has that money been used? One thing that Pakistan really needs to stop doing is compare itself with India in every context, because, I mean, yes, we we are neighbors, but our strategic alliances have completely gone you know, in different directions. Uh, let's just not forget the Pakistan's role in America's so-called war on terror. Let's not forget about the political meddling and interference in Afghan politics. And also, of course, with other parts of South Asian region. I think Pakistani military, the, the public needs to make sure that they're accountable for all political interference and all the political damage that they have brought into the country because they do not understand where their borders end. And I think the military needs to understand that the most than any other institution in the country. And we do also understand that the Pakistani military is not just wrongly famous or being mischievous in the region. It is because there's facts, there's history, and it just wouldn't stop doing that. The narrative that you were talking about earlier, I think every general or military rule has had its own narrative. As I mentioned, Zayaul Haq was on an Islamization narrative. Musharraf, for that matter, was all, you know, singing tunes of enlightened moderation and alliances with the U.S. on war against, uh, on, on terror. So basically, we are going to remove terrorism and we are the only ones that can remove terrorism from in this entire region. In fact, the reality is that they have been actively involved in creating terrorism in this part of the world. And we are seeing what's happening. We just saw what was happening on the borders with Afghanistan a couple of days ago. And the fact that more than half of the country is now panicking about the Taliban and the TTP, the Tariq Taliban Pakistan. But I think one thing where all these military rulers or, or leadership has always been in unison is that their rise to power in Pakistan is linked with, you know, cultivating a collective ethos that portrays politics as inherently corrupt. And so they position themselves as a sole bastion of honesty, discipline, nationalism and Islam as well, which we all understand that uh, Pakistan is really obsessed with and increasingly getting obsessed with religion and Islamization. And then um, it is because of this approach that despite corruption within military, it cannot be stood accountable. It has successfully distanced itself from this prevalent political culture, which it continues to characterize by kinship ties, which the military claims does not exist in the military institution, factionalism, patronage networks, and most importantly, corruption. 
So let's take a moment to step away now from drawing a value judgment on the role of the military in the country and actually look at the mechanisms itself. Uh, in terms of civilian rule, what are the actual mechanisms that allow the military to maintain dominance over civilian political landscape? Well, there's no legal mechanisms for it. I think that when you have rule of law, then the behavior of individuals and groups in a context of rule of law or a context of agreed rules of the game, so institutional stability perhaps would be another way of saying this. When you have institutional stability, then you certainly have a situation in which people can be held to account for what they're doing. And I think that is how many countries have maintained a degree of equilibrium between the people with the guns and the people with the rightful authority to determine which direction those guns get pointed in. But when you have institutional instability, born of conflict that is outside Pakistan and that has not been fomented or initiated by Pakistan. Pakistan did not ask India to annex Kashmir. Pakistan did not ask the Soviet Union to invade Afghanistan. Pakistan certainly had nothing to do with 9-11 or the fomenting of that terror either. But again, I think in Western discourse, it's all too easy to... I, I just did an interview with German television, and they kept referring to the TTP as a homegrown terrorist group. The TTP being the, the Tariqe Taliban Pakistan, which is a, an offshoot of the Afghan Taliban in Pakistan? Exactly. The recent wave of terror that Pakistanis have been experiencing that the good professor rightly referenced is once again principally being driven by these same TTP terrorists. Now, these terrorists are housed in Afghanistan, finance in Afghanistan, seek succor and support in Afghanistan, and have the explicit ideological support and umbrella of the Afghan Taliban. Now, there is a long-standing narrative of how many of Pakistan's problems are of Pakistan's own making. And there's no question that there have been a wide array of confusing and self-defeating tactics over the course of two or three military regimes in Pakistan that have exacerbated Pakistan's violent extremism problem, which is a different problem than the extremism problem that Pakistan also has. And those exist in two different spheres. One is its social and political impact at home, and the other is the violent extremist terrorism that Pakistanis have experienced for a long period of time. I'm going back to the question you asked. The mechanisms through which control is exerted, it's brute force, man. If you have the power to decide what kind of judgments a Supreme Court is going to produce, if you have the power to decide who a prime minister is going to appoint to the cabinet and who they won't, then there's no real mechanisms at play. You just tell people what to do, and either they do it or if they don't do it, they get in some kind of trouble. Some will end up in jail. Some will end up kicked out of the country. Some will you know, go into hiding. But the scale of that oppression or the scale of that violation of the constitution and rule of law and institutional stability is not one that has tipped the balance. And so the fact that Pakistan is broadly still A, a viable country, B, a fully functional one, at least for people living in the big cities that have means. Now, if you are poor in Pakistan, and the vast majority of Pakistanis are poor, life is not as comfortable as the way that I would articulate it to be. So I'm fully conscious of that privilege. And I think that's an important caveat to at least most of what I say. There are parts of this country where the violation of the rule of law by the military has meant much worse things than just whether we can say something on television or not, whether we can write something in our newspaper column or not. And so I think that that taking into account that diverse spectrum of Pakistan, there's no question that the military has had a much better job that it could have done in terms of defending the country whilst not violating the country's people and its constitution and its laws. But again, I would say to link things that are external to Pakistan to things that are internal to Pakistan, I think is a analytical minefield. So I would not in any way suggest 
and others are, of course, free to have their own view on this, but I would never suggest that the problems of Afghanistan were created by Pakistan, just like I would never suggest that all of Pakistan's problems are because of the conflict in Afghanistan. I think things feed off of and into each other. It's important to understand why Pakistani intervention in Afghanistan is a reality. So I would say there are no legal mechanisms for the military to decide who is going to be or not going to be prime minister, but the military enjoys a vastly outsized set of intrusions into civilian life that afford it the continuation of a trend that goes right back to the birthing of the country. You're listening to Air to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu. Au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Air to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Air to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. I'm Sami Shah and I'm joined by Dr. Aisha Jangir and Musharraf Saidi. We're talking about the enduring and pervasive influence of Pakistan's military on the country's domestic politics. There have since in the in the last year or so, however, been certain legal amendments in Pakistan. The, I'm thinking particularly of the Pakistan Army Amendment Bill, which is 2023 that was rolled out, as well as the Official Secrets Amendment Bill. Both of these have influenced or increased Pakistan military's power in certain areas, including freedom of act, carrying out certain legal activities against the civilian population. Why were these needed? If the military is so capable of running roughshod over the laws, why is there a facade of legal pretense presented to the public then? I think there's two factors that inform why the military itself is interested in playing by the book. I think one is that the military's acceptability in the public domain has been an obsession of the military from day one. And I think this has to do with the fact that Unlike, for example, a country like Egypt, which is ethnically and linguistically almost completely homogenous. And so the ability to exert control from one urban center, i.e. Cairo, is much greater than a country that is massively diverse, both ethnically and linguistically and socially. And so in order to rule over such a diverse country, some compact with the people is necessary. I think, again, the professor was right that, you know, the way that compact was manufactured during the Zia regime was through religion. And so that was the Islamization project. But again, I wouldn't blame that on Saudi Arabia. I think those are choices that the Pakistani military made for Pakistan. And others came in and, and engaged with the country on the terms that it wanted to engage on. Um, Musharraf tried a different version of something similar, but in a different direction. I think the recent legislative measures are also, I think, partly informed by the fear, and I think it's a legitimate fear, that international rule of law and the rules-based order, so to speak, although we've seen what that really amounts to in what's happening in Gaza, but that there is a consciousness and a sensitivity that the Pakistani elites have toward making sure that what they do is at least on paper defensible. So you have a series of new changes to how the internet is governed, how criminal activity is pursued, and how expression is curtailed in certain formats and in certain media. And I think that a lot of this is informed by the Imran Khan phenomenon, which is a new kind of problem that, again, has been produced because of the military's intervention and intrusion into politics. But I've spoken at length, and I think maybe I'd love to hear what the professor has to say before we talk maybe a bit more about Imran Khan. Let's now focus then on those political parties, the civilian political parties. In general, how have political parties and their leaders accommodated the power of Pakistan's military? Musharraf mentioned the Imran Khan and his relationship with the military, but that's a more recent one. Going back, um, Aisha, you have said the academics always provide the historical context. Can you give us some historical context there? Um, yes, because, you know, my main research is around this area. I also want to refer to this 
excellent, excellent compilation of polemical essays by Amar Ali Jan to your question, Sami. His book is titled Rule by Fear, Eight Theses on Authoritarianism in Pakistan. And I think this paranoia that has been created around military's relationship with political parties or even military's, you know, grappling, unwavering, absolute power that they have in Pakistan and the creation of this permanent state of emergency in Pakistan, I think is used to deploy excessive violence against popular challenges to the status quo, including those posed by political uh, democratic leaders. For example, we do understand that Pakistan Muslim League, you know, Nawaz group had no other choice but to strategically align with the military interests given the PMLN's history of challenging military authority, even more than Khan, Imran Khan himself. We know how Musharraf came into power. So I think the irony is that Pakistani military makes the very promises of democracy. And so people are pulled into it and also believing. And of course, as I earlier said, by juxtaposing themselves against the political leaders as being corrupt or them as being selfish and probably some of them not Islamic enough. So I think the February 2024 election showcases the military's involvement in domestic political processes. So you mentioned some of the local political parties like the PMLN and Nawaz Sharif and Imran Khan. Can you give us a quick summary, if you will, of the major players? Which are the major civilian political parties in Pakistan? And I know this is a big ask, but in one sentence or two, what's their relationship with the military like? Um, More or less, there are about three to four major political, civil political parties. And of course, Musharraf might be able to update me in case I haven't been able to update myself since I've not been in the country for nine years. Pakistan Muslim uh, League Nawaz, PMLN, which has had rule over the country for over several terms. Then there is PPP, which is Pakistan People's Party. Then there's PTI, Pakistan Tehreek Insaf. So the cricketer, celebrity turned politician, Imran Khan, who is now behind bars, who once used to be the military's blue-eyed boy. How I see the military treating all these political parties, civilian political parties, is that we'll give you guys a chance and the best behaving party is going to get the rule. Uh, Sami, I'll go back to what you were talking about when you go back home and your mom's like, why didn't you get good marks? So it's pretty much mostly like helicopter parenting. Uh, If I want to come back to the fact that the very reason Pakistan is deemed as authoritarian It's not because it has an active authoritarian rule at this point. It is due to this pervasive influence of and interventions by its powerful military into the national political dynamics. And I think this is something that the Pakistani citizens may just be waking up to in terms of not accepting an absolute power in terms of interference in local national politics. Musharraf, there has been a narrative that's been seen abroad outside of Pakistan that the Pakistani public is no longer as accepting of military intervention in civilian rule, in civilian politics. Is that true, the way Aisha described it, that things have changed? And if so, does that mean there's a future where the civilian governments might push back more? I think the jury is out on exactly where we are in this journey. There's two ways to look at what's happened with Imran Khan. The short version, Sami, is that in roughly 2011, at the very height of that terrorist campaign that the TTP was conducting against the people of Pakistan, which really set Pakistan back by 20 years. If you think about the turn of the century, the year 2000, India, China, Pakistan had roughly similar GDPs per capita and roughly similar problems. and from 2000 onwards, China went off, you know, almost vertical. India started climbing almost as vertical, not quite as vertical as China. And Pakistan kind of has stayed broadly at the same place that it's been at. A lot of the mistakes are policy mistakes, you know, that have nothing to do with India or Afghanistan or Iran or China or the outside world. Nobody's forced Pakistan to make internal decisions that are bad for Pakistanis and bad for the Pakistani economy. Having said all that, there is a unique distinction that Pakistan has had to deal with 9-11 onwards, and that is this TTP slash wider terrorism problem that still hasn't gone away. I think part of the reason it hasn't gone away is, again, at least partly informed by mistakes that Pakistan may not have made had it had better decision making. Um, But really, the challenge that I pose to myself is, well, what's the counterfactual 
to the military's decision-making. And so we've seen some glimpses and some hints of what, for example, counterterrorism would have looked like if Nawaz Sharif was in charge because he was in charge. In 2013, newly elected, hugely popular, Nawaz Sharif had a chance to mobilize a counterterrorism narrative and discourse. And he chose to literally turn the other way and not take that responsibility, which led to the military going ahead and making decisions on its own as to how and when it would fight the TTP menace. Concurrent to that, Imran Khan, a leader, a Pakistani leader that was entirely cultivated originally by the military as a counter to the deep popularity that both the PPP and the PMLN enjoyed. Imran Khan's narrative was also that the poor old Taliban are misunderstood and we need to talk to them and we need to stop using drones and we need to befriend these people because they're just fighting for their freedom. Indeed, when the United States left Afghanistan, he said that the Afghan people had broken free of the shackles of slavery. So these are the kinds of civilian leaders and their narratives directly aligned with terrorists, Taliban, Al-Qaeda. In one case, Imran Khan referred to Osama bin Laden as a martyr. Now, that doesn't necessarily qualify Imran Khan as a violent extremist. In fact, I don't think it does at all. But I think that Pakistani politicians, like politicians everywhere, I'm sure you guys know about this in Australia, are deeply, deeply cynical and will use whatever they can to their advantage, especially in the age of populism. Unfortunately, what that means for Pakistan, because of its inherent insecurity, given the neighborhood that it's in, is that over and over and over again, civilian leaders leave large gaps of public policy that are open, they're vacuums. I'm not suggesting for a second that the military is being forced to enter those. I think the military is only too happy to be sucked into those gaps. But those gaps are left by civilian politicians. And I think that the jury on whether there's ever going to be a civilian equation in Pakistan that can contend with the military's intrusions into civilian life, I think that jury is out. I think I personally, and I know a lot of people in my generation, had a very positive view of the democratic consolidation in Pakistan between 2008 and 2011. Uh, that's the period during which a newly elected post-dictator popular government that was reeling from the assassination of Muhtarma Benazir Bhutto in 2007 came together and built in mechanisms that reversed some of the previous generation of military interventions into the constitution. So just like Australia, Pakistan is a federal country, but a lot of the power in Pakistani Canberra had been sucked into Pakistani Canberra, which actually belonged to, for example, New South Wales or Queensland or Tasmania. So a lot of those changes that took place in 2008, 2009, and especially there was something called the 18th Amendment and the National Finance Commission Award in 2010 and 2011, those changes were supposed to have solved the problem of military intervention through back doors. And yet here we are again in 2024, less than a decade and a half later. And in, in essence, we're once again having to contend with the same questions. You know, I'm in my fourth decade and in my lifetime, I have now seen the cycle play itself out. Now it's playing itself out for the fourth time. So I think that when you have a country that is already insecure in terms of the neighborhood that it lives in, with countries like Afghanistan and India at your border, both of whom don't accept your existence in any meaningful way, and demonstrably quite the contrary. And then you also have a domestic compact, a social and political compact that is a non-compact. The reason we have this intervention is because there hasn't been yet an agreement as to what Pakistan is going to be. Now, when I say that there is a context to why the military is the way it is, that is not an excuse for the military to be doing what it's doing. It's simply to say that if we want to have a realistic assessment of what things might look like in 15, 20 years, I think we'll be more and better served 
by looking to the past than by looking into a fantasy future. Sorry, just to interrupt you there, though, if we take what Aisha had asked as well about the current reaction on the street, and and not just the street, on social media and everything, there does seem to be coming out of Pakistan, in terms of the general populace, a growing cynicism of the military's role, presence, involvement. Is that fair as as an assessment of what's happening? Or is that an exaggeration that's you know, we're seeing abroad, but does not reflect what's actually being felt over there. No, it's it's an absolutely fair thing to say. I think what has happened in the last two years has turned a lot of people off. And they're not just turned off with the military. I think there's a generational turning off. And I think it's also analytically dangerous to attribute all of this to Imran Khan. I think in his early 70s, he's evolved into a very, very talented and capable politician. But what's happening is not about Imran Khan. I think it's about a country with 240 million people, out of which 120 million are below the age of 23, Asami. You have a demographic sort of time bomb that has already exploded. So there's all these young people. Now, what did we do to these young people? Well, 26 million children between the ages of 5 and 18 are out of school. 26 million are out of school. So those kids have no chance of coding for AI or working at Microsoft or even getting a highly skilled migrant visa and moving to Australia if if they don't want to live here anymore because they won't have any of the skills that, for example, others that have gone to the great shores of, you know, Brisbane and, and Melbourne or whatever have had. So what's going to happen to those people? Well, at a minimum, even if you and I don't ask that question and the Pakistani military and the Pakistani bureaucracy and the Pakistani political elite don't ask that question, they're asking themselves that question. And when they look around, they see the total lack of accountability for the military and the total helplessness that they experience themselves. So they frame their own lives in opposition to the established rule makers and decision makers in Pakistan, including the military, but not just the military. So I think there is a moment in Pakistan right now that I haven't seen before expressed in the way that it's being expressed. I would be careful and wary of overstating what its long-term implications are, because I think that political energy writ large, we saw this in Tahrir Square, we've seen this time after time after time, that a short burst of high energy political engagement by people who otherwise need to go to work to make ends meet is not a sustainable means of altering the direction of a country. It's much more useful when you have a coherent, rules of the game, institutional stability driven. And that doesn't always have to be democratic, by the way. Saudi Arabia has completely turned around what it used to be over the last decade, and it hasn't done that democratically. It's done that in a different way. India has done it democratically. Now, that's at the expense of a lot of civil rights and a lot of freedoms in that country. But broadly, there's a net positive impact on people's lives in terms of how much they eat and how much they buy. That set of changes in Pakistan has been elusive and I think will remain elusive because we haven't settled the overall social, economic and political compact. And I think that the fact that people are angry, I think, excites a lot of my friends. You know, the, the professor referenced Amar Ali John, who's a dear friend, but another Amar Rashid, who's a leftist politician. I was speaking to him last weekend and we spent a lot of time talking about this and he feels that there's a genuine opportunity here for engaging all these young people and for serving them better politically. My own cynicism or skepticism about this is that the mechanism for servicing them is a brash populist leader who's 71, 72 years of age and really doesn't have either the capability or the constitution to be able to service those needs. Pakistan has really complex problems that need the people that make infrastructure deals at public-private partnerships to build new highways into the desert. Those kinds of skills are what's needed every day in every jurisdiction in Pakistan, and we, we just don't have that. In fact, whatever talent we do have is getting on planes, like I said earlier, and heading off to the you know greener pastures in Riyadh, in Abu Dhabi, in Melbourne, in Singapore, in New York, and London. So we are in an intergenerational quandary of a kind that I haven't seen before. And I think that's in part what's informing this this rising anger that people have, that they're directing towards the military, but I don't see that coalescing into a coherent policy outcome. 
Aisha, do you agree with Musharraf in terms of this being a unique moment in Pakistan's life cycle? And if so, what recommendations would you, taking a long view, have to make to policymakers and stakeholders to address the issue of military influence? Yeah, I definitely agree with Musharraf over the fact that there is this shift in how people look at and talk about a military. And I do think it is what populism can do. I mean, today, if military stands up with Imran Khan again, again, a lot of these young people who have started accusing military of all these horrors in the country, they might again become pro-Pakistani military. And, and I think I'll, I'll cite one more Pakistani political scientist, Asma Fez, who describes, she takes a spin on the word authoritarian and calls Pakistan an establishmentarian democracy. So I think at this point, the political leaders have absolutely no other choice but to bargain with the military, just like Benazir Bhutto had to do by letting military have indirect control of the foreign affairs. I think we are far away from that. But where I see the light at the end of the tunnel is that, first of all, it's very important in the long term to demilitarize our institutions. There's a need to build strong and resilient democratic institutions that do not have retired military officers as CEOs or heads or directors. It's going to take some time. But that's very important. And of course, it also independent judiciaries and free and fair electoral systems. But that's easier said than done. But I think the point where Musharraf was also talking about younger people becoming part of the political process, I think inclusive political process that has to involve diverse segment. You cannot say we'll only give an opportunity to Punjabis because they've got more privilege or more education, leave the Sindhis back, let all Pashtuns get under the umbrella perception that they are terrorists. There needs to be an inclusive political process. And I think this digital mobilization and this digital political participation by younger people is definitely making a difference. There are many, many other things, but I think I would want to wrap up on one of the most important aspects as a peace and humanitarian study scholar or, or peace journalism for that matter is transitional justice. I think there's a need to establish mechanisms for transitional justice, including the accountability for past human rights violations. If it happens, Pakistan will not be the first country to transition away from a military rule towards a civilian governance. We saw it in Brazil, Brazil that was under a dictatorship from 64 to 1985. We saw it in Argentina during the late 20th century, in South Korea in the late 80s, Indonesia, Spain, Chile, you name it. So we've got examples set there. But I think the entire thing comes back to inclusivity. We cannot have a bad Pakistani, good Pakistani thing. And of course, as I said, it's easier said than done. But at least we can look towards a trajectory, democratic trajectory. Our guests have been policy and political analyst Musharraf Zaidi, founder and CEO of Tabad Lab, a think tank and policy advisory firm based in Islamabad, and former journalist and now media analyst Dr. Aisha Jahangir of University of Technology, Sydney. Thank you very much both. Thank you, Sami. It was a pleasure to share space with you and Musharraf. Yeah, thanks a lot. I hope that was useful and we didn't end up confusing uh, the listeners. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcasts app, Spotify, YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, please rate and review it. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. And please help us by spreading the word on your socials. This episode was recorded on the 26th of March, 2024. Producers were Eric Van Bemmel and Kelvin Parham of Profactual.com. Air to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2024, the University of Melbourne. I'm Sammy Shah. Thanks for your company.